Hey y'all, Big Tim here. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Old School and Bass with Big Tim. So, here we are. We all finally made it through the new year. We're back to 2021 and there's a lot of strange things happening. There's a lot of things going on in the world. But this is a fishing program. We're not going to talk about any of the other stuff. So, today we're going to get caught up and kind of review some things that uh, we've talked about in the past. And uh, one of them that really just kind of excites me to no end is how is John Cox going to fish the Bassmaster Elite Series as well as Major League Fishing's Bass Pro Tour as well as the Big Five Tour from what used to be FLW. That's amazing. That guy, they're calling him, they used to call him the Tin Man, now they're calling him the Iron Man. If he can make it through this, he will definitely have run the gauntlet and become an Iron Man. Just simply incredible. But if anybody can do it, it's John Cox. I <laughs> love the way that guy fishes. He really doesn't need practice. I mean, he kind of proved that on a couple tournaments this year where he, did, where he didn't have any or very little practice and uh, came through very well. So I'm really excited to see what happens with John Cox. I think that's going to be really awesome. So hopefully uh, he has a great season money and um, maybe some other people will start thinking about doing it too who knows and one of the other things that we talked about in a prior video was how Jason Christie had left Ranger boats and there's been quite a few people shifting boat manufacturers and everything else and one of which was another big surprise for me was Scott Martin he left Ranger boats who he's been with just like Jason Christie since he started and uh, went over Skeeter that um, is kind of kind of strange. Um, the only thing I could figure is a lot of the people that they were used to dealing with at Ranger Boats are no longer there, whether it's retirement or they moved on to other boat companies. Uh, and also maybe Ranger restructured some of the um, contingency programs for, for the Elite Series and stuff like that. Maybe they're not paying as well. Maybe Skeeter's paying more money if you win out of a Skeeter than Ranger would if you won out of a Ranger. You know, stuff like that. So... Those are big things to consider when, you know, it's your livelihood and that's how you're making your money. And, um, you know, those personal connections also mean a lot. I think uh, Gerald Swindle said at one time, you know, uh, when he left Triton uh, and he went over to Phoenix, you know, he had a personal connection with so many people at Triton Boats that had either retired or left because of the buyout by, um, well, several buyouts, you know, by basically the, the, uh, Fast Pro Group, and um, you know he lost a lot of those personal connections. So that's a big thing, and I understand that having a personal connection where you can call up the phone and say, "Hey, Bob or George or whoever, you know my boat's doing this. What can we do?" And you, you really don't have any connection with somebody, and that that makes a big, big difference. Um, so I totally understand that. And uh, while we're talking about Scott Martin, you know through. The middle of the year, he had to switch motors. You know, he'd been running over Evinrude again since the beginning of his career. But Evinrude actually kind of got out of the outboard business. You know, they didn't make any motors anymore. And uh, that's really a shame because I don't know if people know, but they were the first ones to make an outboard motor back in the 30s, I think it was. I don't know. Um, but uh, they were the first company to make outboard motor. And to see them kind of get out of the business is really amazing to me. Um, their parent company, Polaris, you know, a lot of people know them as making side-by-sides and jet skis and things like that. They're going to continue to do all that, but they decided the outboard motor business after COVID-19 was, was killing them. So they decided to get out of the outboard business. And that's what forced Scott to find a new outboard. You know, it's uh, difficult to run for a company that isn't going to, back their product or anything like that anymore or basically give you any money for it either. So he went to Yamaha and that was probably a good choice for him. Um, Yamaha with the Skeeter, that's probably why he went that direction. He probably knew this, that he was going to go with Skeeter back in August or whatever that was that he determined to uh, switch from Evinrude to Yamaha. One of the other things I wanted to talk about was the Lake Cumberland tournament for the Toyota um, FLW series from last year back in November 
there was a lot of conversation about, um, well, a lot of things about that tournament. And one of the things that drew my interest and aroused my curiosities was the fact that there were some rumors flying around about Jacob Wheeler cheating, uh, fishing in an off-limits area, and uh, how he actually came out and put something out on social media and said that he had uh, contacted the tournament director prior to the tournament and what he was doing was indeed legal. And that was basically fishing the cables off of a dock um, and not fishing the dock itself. And a lot of people are saying because that cable is attached to the dock, it's off limits. But, you know, the tournament director has the final say. But there was one thing that happened that I really thought that, that could have really shed a whole lot of light on the issue. We would have put out two videos, one for the tournament and one for the practice for Cumberland. And I really would have liked to have seen uh, that particular spot, how he was fishing it, and uh, maybe it would have shed some light and people would say, well, yeah, he's, he's definitely in the clear. He's definitely not fixing docks. But I watched both of those videos in their entirety, and um, nothing was shown about fishing even close to any docks. And uh, I found that kind of regrettable. I really wanted to see, uh, not that I want to go fish the spot, but I just want to go see, you know, yeah, definitely he wasn't uh, he wasn't doing anything wrong, and that could have really opened up people's eyes and kind of shut down all the rumor mills and everything else. But that didn't happen, so the speculation is there. Why didn't he show it? And I've heard a couple people say that, but um, like my wife says, it's a done deal. What difference does it make? So you know that's one thing that uh, we'll be keeping an eye on from here on out. But also in regards to the Lake Cumberland Tournament, a lot of people, and this is something I totally didn't even talk about, I totally forgot about it, a lot of people were upset about the size limit changes. They are every year. Um, you know, at Lake Cumberland, Kentucky bass, Kentucky spotted bass have to be 12 inches, large mouth have to be 15, and small mouth have to be 18. But for this tournament, I think they made everything 12 think I know that the smallmouth was definitely at least uh, set down to 15 and you know that changes your whole game plan any of us that go down and fish Lake Cumberland if you're fishing a tournament most of the time you don't go fish for smallmouth unless you're really sure you're gonna catch five good ones because you know turning loose a 17 inch smallmouth is a pretty big deal um, you know that 17 incher is probably gonna weigh two and three quarter pounds uh, it's a pretty sizable fish down there to uh, turn loose. So, you know, unless you're really on smallmouth and you know you're going to catch five over 18, uh, most time people go fish for largemouth first and then go out and try to catch smallmouth as kickers. Totally changes your game plan. And if you have the opportunity to go out to catch 12-inch or 15-inch smallmouth, sure, that's what you'll go do. Because they are plentiful. They're abundant all over the lake. Mostly down on the lower end where those guys fish. And um, there's tons of them. And they're fairly easy to catch. And of course they're a ball to catch. You know, hopefully we get to go down there soon and catch some ourselves. Uh, here it is middle of January and we're already thinking. Matter of fact, I had a couple guys over the other night that uh, we were talking about when we're going to make our Cumberland trip. So, yeah, that'll be a good time. But for us, we're just going fun fishing. So to catch a 12-inch smallmouth or 15-inch, we're having a good time. But in a tournament, to target 18-inch smallmouth is one thing. Um, but if you change the state creel or whatever, uh, and you go after 15-inch fish or even 12, sure, why not fish for smallmouth all day? It changes your game plan entirely. And... Um, some guys, I know, were, were complaining about the fact that it's maybe ruining a natural resource, and I, I don't think that's the case because there's plenty of those fish. You know, and to catch them and unhook them and throw them back in the water, I mean, that's what we're doing in practice anyway. Um, but to catch 12, 13, and 14 inches and put them in a live well, um, chances are if you're going to win a tournament, those 12 or 13 inch uh, smallmouth aren't going to do you any good anyway. So they're not going to ride in a live well long before you call them away. I know we had a, I wasn't there, but um, Joey fished a TBF tournament 
down on Lake Cumberland a couple of years ago, and they had a no call rule. And I don't know that I agree with that either, but um, that's another possibility. If you're going to lower the size limit, you have a no call rule. I don't know. I actually believe, and I know I'm going to catch a lot of grief for this, but as plentiful as the fish are, I think for a tournament, because you're catching and releasing them, that the limit should be 15 inches on smallmouth across the board. No matter who you are, no, how, no matter how big of a tournament is, and if you're going to keep them to eat them, then maybe it needs to be bigger. Uh, I know it's hard to draw a line between the tournament fishing and recreational fishing, but it can be done. Like in Florida, they give you a special tag for, for bigger tournaments at least. So I don't know if we can do that for the small ones. You know, club tournaments and whatnot might be might be more difficult to establish a 15-inch limit for those smallmouth. But the 18-inch limit is something that was instated on Cumberland, I don't know, probably about 20 years ago, somewhere around in there, back when um, there was question about whether or not the actual world record smallmouth came from Dale Hollow. There, were, there was a lot of rumors going around that uh, they opened up that fish and they put clock parts and reel parts and outboard motor parts and all this in this bass to make it way more uh, so that they could say that they got the world record smallmouth. And it took a few years of investigating, but finally they realized that that wasn't true. But in the interim, everybody was jumping around, going through hoops, trying to uh, make sure that the state record or the world record, I mean to say, was local you know here in Kentucky and particularly in Tennessee and that's when we started seeing some of the size limits really jump up you know like at Douglas Lake uh, you're I think they have to be over 20 inches 21 for a smallmouth and of course at Dale Hollow you've got you're only allowed to keep one smallmouth over 21 and one under 15 or 16 I can't remember exactly I think it's under 16 so you're only allowed two smallmouth because they're trying to grow and make sure that the world record would come out of there, even though it's already been determined that David Hayes smallmouth back in, what, 1955 is the official world record. And Cumberland followed suit. They raised their limit on smallmouth at the same time, hoping maybe that they could get the world record out of there. Um, but, you know, it's a fairly new thing. Like I said, it's been in the last 20, maybe 25 years. I don't think it's 25. I don't know. But it's definitely been in the last 20, 25 years that um, that size limit for smallmouth has changed on Lake Cumberland. And um, for tournaments, I can understand it. But like I said, it's hard to distinguish between tournament and recreational fishing uh, and the meat eaters, you know, the people who are catching them, take them home to eat. So I guess I can kind of relate but I sure would like to see that 15-inch rule for for any tournament. You know, when we go, you know, when me and the guys go down just for our fun, we're catching and releasing everything anyway. We always count by uh, basically a 15-inch as a keeper, you know. But um, depends on the situation, who catches it. You know, if I catch it, 15 is a keeper. If they catch it, it's not. It's got to be. It's got to be 18. But hey, it's my vote. I get to do that, those guys, right? Anyway, so we're looking forward to that trip. Can't wait. Mm. March, April, somewhere around there. And uh, hopefully things in 2021 from a fishing standpoint are going to be different. And uh, hopefully we're catching a bunch more fish this year. All right, so here we are toward the end of the video. And uh, I'm going to say something I haven't said in quite a while. But if y'all are watching this video and you're enjoying it, check out the other stuff. Give me a thumbs up and please be sure to subscribe if you haven't done it already. You know, that means a ton uh, for YouTube. The more subscribers you get, the more you uh, are able to um, have some leeway with things, making longer videos and all kinds of things. So please subscribe. Please like, give me a thumbs up and uh, mention it to your friends. Share it. You know, the more views, the better. Uh, I know some guys don't want to share information that they get because they don't want their buddy to have the same information. But um, do me a favor and share with some of your friends and let them know about the channel. Have them log on and check out some of the other old videos. You know, right now it's the wintertime. I don't have much content that I'm producing. So 
make sure to check out some of the old stuff. Maybe there's videos that you missed. Go through the list. You know, the Truth Behind the Trophy series, I just came up with one that I found that I'd actually forgotten about. I'm going to be shooting some more Truth Behind the Trophies. Uh, these are going to be a little different. These are going to be the fails. So there's a lot of fails. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have video of the fails, but um, there's a lot of fails that we've gone through in the tournament uh, trail to talk about and hopefully teach some lessons, even though it's taken me several attempts to learn the lessons on some occasions. But anyway, look forward to that stuff. So thanks for watching, and uh, we'll catch you the next time on Old School and Bass with Big Tim.